Hey, you guys. I just wanted to touch base with you for a couple minutes here. We had a, a couple really good questions at the end of class this week uh, that uh, I thought gave us a, a good opportunity to connect the central limit theorem to what we were discussing this week, which was confidence intervals. Uh, so uh, right, as, right as class ended, some people left, you know, we had that conversation, but I don't think everyone got to hear it. So I just wanted to send out a, a quick video here uh, to, to kind of talk about what we discussed at the end of class as, as time ended, and just make sure everyone got to kind of hear this, uh, this connection. So the question that the, uh, uh, your, your peer asked was in relation to uh, the example that we did. Uh, now let me bring that example up real quick. And so the example that we did in class said that a recent study of 42 eighth grade boys, the mean number of hours per week that they spent playing video games was 19.6 hours with a standard deviation of 5.8. And the question said find the 99% confidence interval uh, for the population mean. So um, the question that ended up coming up here was that, uh, you know, why, why are we taking only one sample? Um, why don't we take multiple samples? And I, I thought that question um, brought us back to that idea of the central limit theorem. So, so again, let me um, just remind you real quick, you know, of the central limit theorem here. So when we were doing the central limit theorem, uh, what we we were connecting to was between the idea of you know having the population of data and sampling from that population. Right? So just as a you know. Quick reminder with the simulation we used in class. Right, suppose I'm taking samples of size 20, and I have the population of data here. So I randomly select 20 data points from that population, and then out of those 20 data points, I find the mean and I plot that mean. We see that fall below, and then I randomly sample again another sample of 20 data points. In this case, I find the mean of those 20 data points and I plot that mean. And I continue doing that over and over again, right? That was the idea behind the central limit theorem. Being that, um, as I continue sampling over and over again, I'm gonna build the distribution of sample means that we're starting to see be created down here. And I'm just gonna um, jump through the animation real quick, right? And click a couple times. So here's me taking more and more samples. So just as a reminder, let me, let me stop here, right? So just as a, a reminder, the concept being if I do this over and over and over and over again, um, I'm going to end up building a distribution of all the sample means, right? So in theory, right, uh, over the long term, that distribution will be normal, and the mean of the population will be the mean of the distribution, or I should say in, in reverse, right, the mean of the distribution of sample means will equal the mean of the population. So that was what we talked about in 5.4. So, so the question the student asked, if, you know, why do we only do one sample? I thought that was a great question. And um, typically the answer to that question is, well, we can't afford to do multiple samples. We can't afford to do hundreds of samples of, of uh, what did we have, 42 eighth graders um, in that example, right? So we, um, we don't have the, the manpower, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources in general to do multiple, multiple, multiple samples to build a huge distribution of sample means. So what we do instead is we take one sample, we find the mean of that sample, and then we build an interval around that mean. So, so again, just to remind you of the work that we did um, on that example, right? Um, part of the work we do by hand is we first find the, what we call the margin of error, right? And so, you know, we talked about this um, this week, you know, here's the, the sampling error, right? This is the uh, standard deviation of that sampling distribution. So this will be the standard deviation of our sampling distribution. And then based on the level of confidence we want, right, in this case, 99% confidence, we're going we're gonna to stretch out that standard error with that critical value. So for this example, we had 2.575 uh, as our critical value. So we need to move 2.575 uh, standard deviations uh, above the mean and below the mean to encompass 99% of the data. So we have this one sample, and we're going to take our standard deviation of our sampling distribution, assuming we took multiple samples, right? Um, and we're going we're gonna to stretch um, out to 2.305 hours above and below our sample mean to build our confidence interval. Right? So again, we talked about this in gory detail in class. So um, we talked about the, the concept is we're going to take our sample mean, we're going to add that margin of error and subtract that margin of error, and that's going to build an interval that we hope to catch the population mean 
in that interval, right? So, um, so here's my sample mean of 19.6 for this one sample of 42 eighth grade boys. So we add the margin of error to get above our upper limit, right, of 21.9, and then we subtract the margin of error to get the lower limit. So we're taking this 2.305, we're adding and subtracting 2.305 to build this interval. So, so again, um, why do we only take one sample? Well, because that's about what we can afford. Right? And so we're going to build one sample, um, we're going to take one sample, and then we're going to build an interval around that mean. So again, the, the concept here is that we're, we're saying with 99% confidence we have caught the population mean in between that interval. Okay? Um, and again, that comes back to that central limit theorem, right? that over the long term, um, we're going to have our sampling distribution of sample means. Now, I just want to show you real quick, if I only take one sample, Right, let me animate one sample. So here's a sample of uh, 20 data points from this population, and we find the mean of that uh, sample. So here's that mean. Right now, that mean could have been over here. It could have been lower. Right, the mean could have been higher. Now, it just depends on the random selection we get. But in, in this particular sample, here's our mean. And you notice the mean of our population is right here. It's at 16. And it looks like the mean of our sample was pretty close to that. So, so, but we don't know that, right? We don't know what the mean of the population is. In this example, we don't know what the mean hours of 8th grade boys are who, who are playing video games. who are hoping to catch that mean in our interval. So, so again, visually, we find that one sample mean, and we add and subtract to that sample mean, and we build an interval around that one sample mean, knowing that that sample mean lives in this larger sampling distribution, and we're going to be catching that population mean in that interval. Now, one other question I want to address, and then, and then done here that we talked about at the end of class. Um, a student said, "Well, how do, how do we know for sure we're going to catch the population mean?" And you know, the reality is that um, we don't. So, I want to bring up this simulation here for you, real quick, to just illustrate that idea for you. Right. So, the idea of being you know ninety nine percent confident basically says that you know if we were to do a hundred samples, ninety nine of the intervals we build would catch the population mean. One out of a hundred wouldn't. So we're we're playing the odds. That's really what we're doing. So when we build that 99% confidence interval, even though we're taking one sample, we know that out of a hundred, it it has a great chance of being one of those 99. Now just to show you, um, you know, in practice um, with the simulation, the simulation is uh, pretty cool. When I click the sample button, what I'm going to do is take samples of size 20, and I'm going to take a hundred samples. Now, it is known in the simulation that the mean of the population is 50. So when I click the sample button, it's going to build confidence intervals. And each interval that it took, it found a sample mean of that interval. And then it built a confidence interval. So if we look at this one at the very top, you can see the sample mean would be right in the middle of the interval. And then we add and subtract to the sample mean and we build this interval. So the blue interval is the 99% interval. And you can see that we caught the population mean of 50 inside that interval. And in fact, if we co look collectively at all of the confidence intervals, for this one particular run of the simulation, all 100 of the intervals caught the population mean. And zero of them missed it. And then, you know, just for comparison of the 95% confidence intervals, um, 97 of the 100 caught the population mean of, of 50 for this problem. Three of them missed, right? So, so again, two questions asked at the end of the class I thought were very meaningful. One was why do we take one sample? That's a great question. We, we typically can't afford to do 100 samples or more and literally build this distribution of sample means. And then with that one sample, how do we know we can, we can trust the result that we have? Well, well, we don't know for sure, right? In reality, we don't know the population mean. We're going to play the probabilities. We're going to play the odds. And, and then a 99% confidence interval, you know, 99 out of 100 times, we're going to catch the population mean, right? Or a 95% confidence interval, 95 out of 100 will catch the population mean. All right, so I hope that addresses some of those common questions I think are very meaningful conversations to have. Uh, if you guys continue to have questions, you know, post on the discussion board uh, or shoot me an email or bring them to class next week.